dealing with the hard words. I'm bringing our brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Yeah. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living. Well, good morning. Good morning. Hey, my name is Bill Blue. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I get the privilege to be the pastor of Discipling Ministries here at the well. Um, several years ago, I had the privilege to be with 700 quality students and adults in Chicago. On this particular day, half the group stayed back and prayed for three hours while the rest of us went out to the streets to learn how to listen to other people's stories and to share our, our own story right there along the beaches of Lake Michigan. Around 3 in the afternoon, we could see we were near Navy Pier, and there was a storm coming off the lake. I don't know if you've ever been on one of the Great Lakes. But the storms are very obvious when they come in. And it was coming in and coming right toward us. And the rain, what that would do is that drive everybody off the beaches, which makes sense. You don't stay on a beach in the rain. And that would also limit our chance to really share with them and limit the chance for us to be able just to listen to people. And then suddenly the storm turned south, and you could see it turn from Navy Pier, and shoot south. And it soaked all of South Chicago. 
when our group returned that next that afternoon uh, with the group that we were, where we were staying at, our, that group that was there told us, or excuse me, we told them about how the storm had come and we weren't sure what to do and, and we weren't sure we thought for sure we'd be drawn off the beach. And some of the students who had stayed back during those times praying asked us, when did the storm kind of veer away? And we thought, well, right around 3 o'clock. And those kids' eyes lit up who had stayed back. They looked at me and said, do you realize that at 3 o'clock, the leader of the prayer time asked us to pray that the bad weather would not limit our conversations or your conversations about Jesus? See, through united prayer, God moved in a powerful way. He changed the weather. And we got to see God flex his muscles uh, for his purpose. See, as a people, as a church, as we gather and as we're scattered throughout the week, we need to be a praying church. First, because the Jesus who we follow, who we love, prayed. He's our example. Second, because prayer is the powerful weapon, the key weapon. This is, I don't know who said this, it's anonymous, but it's a great quote. Prayer is a weapon forged in the fires of Calvary and effective at defeating all opponents of our God. Amen? Yeah. Third, the reason why it's important is because prayer is the key to making disciples who can make disciples. One of my favorite writers about discipleship, Carl Wilson, said this about prayer. He said, prayer is one of the most important aspects of building disciples. If one is to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he must pray. Now listen to the last sentence. Indeed, if he does everything else right in terms of making disciples, yet he fails to pray, nothing significant will happen. Prayer is key. And I want you to catch our church prays well. Our church prays well. Over the next two months, there, thank you. Over the next two months, we'll be starting a new emphasis here at the well where we will gather concerned people who will, play, who will pray regularly and specifically for the total needs of the ministry, the purpose for spiritual impact. We'll call this new emphasis prayer warriors. It's a term that you will hear. And my desire is to gather at least 30 people who will pray on a regular basis, four minutes a day for five days a week. They'll pray specifically for short, clear prayer requests and targets. And third, they'll pray for the total needs of the ministry. The way we'll accomplish that is, is the different ministry leaders will give me prayer requests that are short and specific, and we'll put them there for those people to pray. End result is kingdom impact. Think about this. What might God do through 10 hours of united specific prayer a week? What might God do through 40 hours of united specific prayer for a month? It's like hiring somebody to pray a whole week for us. <laughs> it's amazing the potential as it multiplies. What might God do uh, in your own prayer life as you're one of these prayer warriors as a strengthened through regular united prayer? So the question is then, how do you get involved in this new movement of prayer? You can use today's comment card to list your contact information and simply write PW beside your name. And then as you leave today, as you place your offerings in the bins, place that also there. For those of you who are joining us at home, I encourage you just to email me at bill at thewell.church. And what will happen is I'll send you out a ministry description that specifically states how this works. A little one-pager, short and to the point. Um, and then we'll begin to get, we'll probably kick it in in August is my goal. So I encourage you to consider that. You'll hear about that consistently from me over the next few weeks. For VBS, we just want to encourage you. It's this next week. You, there's some great little handouts out there laying around out in the commons area. I encourage you to grab one of those, share those with those, your neighbors. If you've got questions, talk to Marissa. Here are two prayer requests, and I want you, if you I know no man has, has a pin on them, but ladies, if you want to write this down, um, I have one, but I have, I have to remember things, so I have to write things down. Uh, well, I asked her, what are the prayer requests for this week? And I want to give you specific prayer requests that are short and to the point. First one is that the lead team will finish their preparations for the week. It's kind of like planning family vacation with 100 nephews and nieces going with you, if you can picture that, which is a scary thought. Uh, but that's what you want. Hey, pray for those final preparations. And secondly, just two requests that each child would end the week with one God-given takeaway where they'll leave being absolutely confident, hey, God really wants me to take this next step. 
So I ask you to pray for those things. Also for baptism. You see that coming up also. It's in your bulletins. Or not your bulletins. Your um, Well, that's a bulletin. Uh, on June 28th, if you've never taken the step of believer's baptism, I encourage you to talk it over with one of the staff. If you're, if you're a child, uh, I encourage you to talk to your parents and spend some time with Marissa. If you're a youth, again, talk to Pastor Nick. And if you're an adult, uh, talk to Pastor Josh. And then just let Pastor Josh knows once you begin to look at it, if you're going to do that, then contact him so he can begin to organize the service as we look forward to that. So please stand with me and let's pray since it's so important. What I want you to do is I want to involve you in prayer. For the next 30 seconds, all I want you to do is two specific measurable prayers. Ask God to speak through you. You don't come to church for what you can get. That's maybe a part of it. But you come to church for what you can give. And so the first one, I want you to ask that God will speak through you today. Maybe it's as you greet somebody as you leave. Maybe it's your child next to you and they ask you. A, my grandkids are always asking me questions during the sermon, like, what does that mean? Uh, but somehow they got to speak through you. So first of all, spend some time asking God to speak through you. And then for this last little bit, ask God to speak to you. Ask God to speak to you. I, I kind of dare you to do that. Most of us don't do that, but I dare you to do that. See what God does. God, I ask you to speak through us today, that each of us here would be listening to your spirit as to what you want us to do, whether it be encourage the person who seems a little quiet, uh, whether it be you know, just to talk to somebody, to, to write things down. Just God, to speak through us today. And then speak to us. I ask you to move in such a way that as we sing our songs together and focus on who, who you are, that you give us a clear message. That you speak to us through the songs, through our worship. Then speak to us also, as Pastor Josh shares, that you would speak to us and help us to see in our hearts what that next step is, to take that step of obedience, which is true worship. So God, we take all this, and with glad and expectant hearts, uh, we place them into your hands. Amen.
came they were all together in one place suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them all of them were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them now they were staying in jerusalem god-fearing jews from every nation under heaven when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's commemoration and celebration of receiving the Holy Spirit by the early church. And after he ascended into heaven, Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit, from whom they would receive power to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So on the day of Pentecost, just as promised, the sound of a violent wind filled the house and tongues of fire came to rest at each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were given the power of communication, which Peter used to begin the ministry for which Jesus has prepared him. After the coming of the Holy Spirit, the disciples did not stay in the room basking in God's glory, but they burst out to tell the world. This was the beginning of the church as we know it. So let's continue as the church singing with the Holy Spirit because that's his gift. No place I would rather be Be. 
Father, let that not be just words from our mouths, just passing through our heads. Let them be the heart cry of our soul. Lord, let us crave you. Teach us to crave you as we crave nourishment, as we crave meals, as we crave uh, water when we are thirsty. Lord, I pray that you will teach us to crave you and your spirit in very physical ways. So, Lord, I just pray now that in this room that we would be hearers of your word. And as you, your scriptures also tell us, not just hearers, but doers of your word. Lord, as we transition into this time of teaching, I ask for me, for more of you and less of me. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart in this time be pleasing in your sight. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Be seated, and our little ones can head out. The average age in the room just jumped drastically. Great question. I want to start out uh, with 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 each of you. Uh, I want you to, to think about this in just for a second. Uh, it's a great question that we all need to ponder and consider regularly. What does the world know about you from observe? Or what does the world know about God from observing your life? As a Christian, as a follower of God, they, they should be able to follow you and understand uh, who God is. So if someone were to follow us every day for a week with the specific intent of like kind of hiding back and saying, I want to learn about God by watching them. They say they're a Christian. They talk about God. So I'm, I'm going to just kind of be in the shadows, just kind of sneak around um, and just watch them. And, and what, what do they know? What do they believe about God to be true because of watching you? So how we live communicates what we believe about God, regardless of what we say we believe. How we conduct business, how we talk about others, the activities we participate in, the language we use, the TV shows that we watch and talk about, and many, many more things give evidence of our belief or our unbelief about God. If we truly believe that God cares about all of those things, then I think we would take more care with some of those things. But as I tend to see it, the average Christian in America believes that God cares very little about those things because they care very little about those details as well. In the passage that we're going to study this morning, we're, we're challenged to care, care very deeply about the, the details of our lives and how we live, particularly the parts of us that are on display to the general world around us. Because the parts of, the, uh, parts of us that are on display to the world around us can either help with the message of the gospel, or they can or hurt the message of the gospel. How we live sends a greater message than what we say we believe. It's just that simple. In the passage we're going to study, we're going to learn all about that. But case in point, I just want to give some examples. I've had real-life conversations with, with many people, particularly non-Christians, when I, when I talk about what I do for a living, and they share their experience with their, and I'll use the quotes, Christian boss how they say he gathers them for prayer at the beginning of every day, and then he goes out and he cuts shady business deals all day long. And he sends that message. Or she's greedy, and she treats her employees with contempt. What message do you think these bosses are sending? What happens when you put a Bible verse all over your workspace, and, the big, and you're the biggest gossip in the office? Or you're openly hostile toward others. You applaud the failures of others when you see them fail around you. Uh, you'd think that a coffee mug that says the joy of the Lord is my strength is, strong enough, is a strong enough message to overcome your public brokenness. Or posting things on, on Facebook and Bible verses that, that contradict how people see you live. Is the only thing overtly Christian about you is that you don't cuss very often. If you want to know the truth about your faith, ask the people who you, who you live and work with. They know whether or not your faith is important to you or it's just lip service or just an, an hour on Sunday. They know what you truly believe. In the book of 1 John, we're challenged with this. Dear children, and I love the, the, the best um, translation, you know, you take the Greek and it kind of goes together with that. And it's, it's not just dear children or even uh, John also uses the word beloved. It's divinely loved ones. It's, it's God's people. So he's saying God's dearly loved, chosen, selected, amazing people. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. There's things, these things have to connect deeply in our lives. 
as followers of Jesus, the truth of our love and our words is displayed by our actions. So what do your actions say about your faith? What do my actions say about mine? When I was younger, uh, in the 80s, and uh, I know that many of you were not even born yet, there was this great question, maybe some of you remember it, it was, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I'll say that at the outset this morning, I kind of hope that I can step on some toes today and really push you in some areas. I pray, and I have prayed, that my preaching would lead to conviction. Good biblical conviction. The Holy Spirit telling you where you need to change. I hope that we all experience a greater level of urgency because we live in urgent times. There, is, there has been no greater need for the church to be light in our world than in the times that we're living in now. I'm not going to say these are the darkest times because 150 years ago we picked up arms and killed one another. So that, that's pretty dark. But we do live in dark times. We live in the darkest times that any of us have experienced. And the world needs the church. Our world needs the church. The world needs to hear the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they need to see that message reflected in the lives of the people who are sharing it. Because the problem is that the saving truth of the gospel message falls on deaf ears when those proclaiming it live ungodly lives and show no evidence of redemption. When Christians live sinful lives, we can hardly expect unbelievers to embrace a message that claims to save us from the sin that we say we're saved from. God demonstrates his saving power through his saved people. Think about that. God demonstrates his saving power through his saved people. I wish he did it another way. Because that's a lot of pressure and a lot of natural accountability. And unfortunately, it places an urgency on our lives that if we're honest, that urgency is unwelcome. There are days that I, I don't want to be good. I want to be mean. I want to force my way. I want to tell people to shut up. I want to tell people to leave me alone. And I know that I'm ruining some of your images of St. Joshua. And, and some of you are like, nope, that's pretty much what I expect. But I, I, I do my best on a daily basis to keep my sinful desires at bay because I know that if it is by grace that I have been saved, it is by grace that I must live. Grace should permeate every aspect of our lives. And there's a godly grace that, that, that we will get to in just a few moments. But for right now, there is a, a general grace that, we, that, that I want to talk about for a minute. Let me just say that grace is the X factor that helps us get through the difficult times in life. Grace is needed to overlook the small offenses that others commit against us. Grace is what we give ourselves when we don't live up to our own arbitrary standards of perfection. We're, we're, we're some of the most difficult people on ourselves that anybody can find. We're just tough on ourselves. But grace is often what we expect others to give us, but what we don't give to others, right? But we, the church, are the medium by which grace is most effectively experienced in the world. And we need to come to terms with the fact that how we live, how much grace we, we spread and, and send into the world either helps or hurts the message of Jesus. But as I said, grace is so much more than just that. And we'll get into that now in Titus 2, uh, verses 11 to 14. And this is where we're teaching through, um, we're calling it top 10. But these are the things that, that I find incredibly important. And, and this is one of my favorite verses. And if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, you know that if it's one of my favorite verses, the sermon's long. So just get ready. We read this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. If you're going to memorize one scripture this year, that's the one. I mean, that has it all. That is a, a full complement of the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the church, we often talk about being saved by grace, and rightly so. Because grace is a wonderful aspect of our faith. And the best definition that I've ever heard, this is not mine, about, of grace is that grace is unmerited favor. Grace is an amazing gift that we know that we just don't deserve. If you've ever received a gift, like an extravagant gift that someone gave to you, you're immediately humbled. 
they give you this gift, and you're like, I, I don't deserve this. This is too much. And it, it immediately humbles us, and, that, and that's what grace is. Now, I've received gifts or awards that I can justify that I'm deserving of having because I've earned it. Maybe I've, maybe I've won a competition. I don't, I, that's not a graceful gift given to me. I don't appreciate it because I did something for it. The grace, is, grace of, the grace of God is something that I did nothing for. And it leads me to a, to a deep sense of repentance and remorse for my brokenness. And the truth is that when we underestimate the value of something, we fail to truly appreciate it. And so do we actually comprehend the unmerited favor of God that came to us at the great cost of Jesus' life? But it was more than just a life. Others have given their lives for people, but it, it didn't merit the grace of God. But this life was special. This life was, was perfect. It was, the, it was the first sinless life which made him absolutely undeserving of death. It was also the mockery and the humiliation, the illegal trials as they marched Jesus around the streets of the city. It was the sleep deprivation, the torture, the beatings, the scourging, the carrying of the cross on his bleeding back, the nails in his hands and his feet. It was the pain of his body weight hanging from those nails. It was the torn flesh scraping against the splintered wooden cross as his diaphragm heaved instinctively to draw breath and preserve his life as his soul cried out for death. More than that, it was the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future, laid upon him in the moment. It was the wrath of God pinpointed on Jesus with laser-like focus, with the weight of a million planets, pressing him into the cross, and at the worst moment for any human in history, it was the God of the universe, the one with whom Jesus enjoyed constant and perfect fellowship with, along with the Holy Spirit from before time, turning his back on Jesus, forcing Jesus to cry out in sheer physical, emotional, and now spiritual agony. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a heart cry. That was a question. Why did it have to happen this way? But he knew. He understood that truth. And so we have to look at that and ask ourselves, why did Jesus deserve to die? And the answer is Jesus did not deserve to die, but he needed to die for us to experience grace, for us to have the extravagant gift of his unmerited favor upon us. And why do we only think about this horrific stuff on Good Friday? Why do we not truly appreciate this grace every single day? And why do we think Jesus gave all of his life spiritually so that we could sum it up with just trying to get across the finish line? Why do we think that the that, that bare minimum would pass for faith? If the cross of Christ teaches us anything, it's that faith requires full commitment. Not what passes for casual Christianity today. And this is not a guilt trip. If it were, it was a guilt trip against me. These are words to myself first. This is an invitation to contemplate the reality that while grace is free to us, it is certainly not free. Grace is an extravagant gift that should, be, that should regularly humble us as we think about the actual cost of our grace. And what we have to see in the subtleties of today's passage is that grace is a person. The unmerited favor of God to us is the person of Jesus Christ. Grace appeared in human form to offer salvation. The grace of God is more than a divine attribute. It is a divine human. Jesus Christ not only was God incarnate, he was grace incarnate. In Paul's writing, he wants us to get this, so he articulates this truth a couple more times, but here's one. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. This kindness, or this grace of God, teaches us very important aspects of God's character. And one is that God shows up, and God gives extravagant gifts. Don't we love that, that person at, at Christmas? You know that person who's going to get a great, give a great gift. It should be all of us. We should all be that generous. But we are all, there's always a person that we're looking forward to getting a gift from them. Because when they show up, they give and bring extravagant gifts. It's a beautiful picture 
of God's grace. We as Christians, we should be the best gift givers there are because that's what Jesus did for us. We should show up. We should give. We should be generous beyond measure. God does not manage things from afar, and he is not stingy. He stepped into our reality, and he continues to do so because we continue to need him, and we need the salvation that he offers. God has deep desires for us, and they all start with salvation. Our salvation is the most important thing to him. In 1 Timothy, Paul refers to God as the one who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Wants all people. There's nobody that God is so mad at that he doesn't want them to come to faith. He wants all people. And the fact that he sent Jesus to die on a cross shows his level of commitment to offering salvation to us. Grace is of central importance to the Father, and he is eager to offer it. So eager, in fact, that he took the divine initiative to come. Now, eagerness is, is a great word that we'll talk about as we get toward the end of this text. But eagerness is, is something that we should all feel when it comes to our faith. But grace is not something that, that God just bestows on us. We have to be willing to receive the grace. Have you ever tried to, uh, to do something nice for someone and they just wouldn't let you do it? They just wouldn't receive it? You wanted to give a gift and they just kept saying, no, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't, no, don't do that nice thing for me. It, it's kind of infuriating. You just want to say, just take the gift. Just let me do this thing for you. Well, how do you think God feels? when untold millions upon millions of humans reject his wonderful gift. He's not infuriated, but he is heartbroken. The Apostle Peter describes it this way. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, there it is again, everyone to come to repentance. There's no one that God does not want to come to repentance. Let me just repeat that as I did already. But God will not force his favor, and he will not demand his forgiveness upon us. He offers it, but we must receive. Grace is received simply by confessing our sins and turning to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. The recognition of personal sin is becoming more and more of a difficult message for people to hear. Increasingly, people are offended that you would refer to them as innately sinful or being born with original sin. But we take our cues from the Bible, and the Bible makes that very clear when it tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the same way that, that God wants all people to come to repentance, he also knows that all people have sinned. There is no escaping that. In the book of 1 John, we also read that. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Those who claim to be without sin are simply delusional, haven't thought deeply about even what they've done in that day. And that verse continues with the best news of the Bible when it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful text. But what is becoming increasingly difficult for the church is that we can no longer just point to those words of the Bible as effectively as we used to. And so while, while it is true that the living and the breathing words of God have the power to heal and convict in the, in, in the spot, on the spot, a general lack of trust and respect for the Bible has permeated our culture. You can no longer say, well, the Bible says this because they just don't care. So this lack of trust in the Bible is, is even causing divisions in the church. Some of the things that we all used to agree on are regularly up for debate even from some pulpits. And this is confusing to our society. And they mistrust the Bible because they see our mishandling of it. That too often, we don't believe what we're professing because we don't live what we say we believe. But we have to, we, the church, the one that God unleashed on that day of Pentecost, we have to believe that the gospel will do what it has already done numerous times in our world in the past. The gospel transformed the unbelieving world that we find in the New Testament, and it can transform our unbelieving world today. Our current, our current world does not surprise God. And the truth is that we have more in common with the first century church than we have with the last century church. The truth is we have more in common with the first century church than we have with the last century church. Many of us were a part of that last century church. That church is gone. 
God is breathing fresh life into us. And we need to adapt. Stay true to his word, but realize that, that we're no longer sharing the gospel with 1950s America. We're sharing the gospel with a culture not unlike the first century. The Greeks, the Romans, the Asians. This means that, that we have a broad range of belief systems that reject absolute truth. In our, in, in, so our world really only mirrors the society God chose to launch his, launch his church from. So this modern church, we have this unique and wonderful opportunity to see communities transformed in the ways that it, has, that it hasn't seen communities transformed in up to 2,000 years. We have to have confidence that God wants to reorder our communities, that he can and that he will reorder our communities. But to do so, he might first need to reorder some of our lives. Which is why the verse that we're looking to today reminds us the transformative nature and the power of the gospel, not just in our world, but in our lives. So again, maybe the world has rejected our message of hope because it looks at our lives and, they see, and it sees in us hopelessness. The fact is that, that grace is not just something we receive. Grace, is, grace actually changes every aspect of our lives if we will let it. And this grace does, does something in us internally. And the first thing that it does, and we learn this from the text today, is it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. we got to get better at saying no. Because once sin has lost its power, grace will give us new desires. Or should I say that, that sin should increasingly lose its power on us. So freedom from ungodliness and worldly passions is a lifelong battle that must be waged on a daily basis. And while we have God's word and the church to help us with this battle, we have an even greater weapon at our disposal. It is the Holy Spirit of God who has taken up residence in us. We celebrate that fact today as we already have on Pentecost Sunday. Paul in intentionally uses the word teaches to show that this is a process. There is no divine download. We must become students of righteousness. We don't just get saved and stand there like this. And God goes, all right, I'm just, just going to quick, like a thumb, I'm going to stick a thumb drive in your arm and give you everything you need to know. Now, we must become students of righteousness. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit taught by the Spirit, as he explains spiritual, rea spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. But a teacher is only as effective as a student who is willing to listen and submit. There's some teachers in here right now that are so glad it's summer, and they would say amen to that. I can't teach you what you don't want to know. I can't teach you when, you, when you're too proud to learn. Sadly, through middle school and high school, I didn't learn very much because I was not humble enough to listen. And sadly, my process of godliness is taking much longer than it probably needs to because of my continued spirit of rebelliousness. So just to kind of wrap this up today, that's kind of a misnomer. You think I'm going to be done in like five minutes. I'm not. <laughs> Let me share four characteristics that we can adopt as students from this text that will help us in the process of godliness. Even shift, even the shift in seeing ourselves as students in the process, in a process, will give us the humility to become learners. First off, we see that students live self-controlled lives. Self-controlled actually translates in the Greek word sophronos, which carries the basic idea of, of having a sound mind. Followers of Jesus have a sound mind, that we know that we're renewed by, the, or we're, we're changed by the renewing of our minds. God gives us new thoughts, new ways of thinking. The Holy Spirit changes us and reorders our brains first. A sensible follower does not allow circumstances or, bad, or the bad influence of others to distract us or, or, or mess, up, with our, mess our, up our judgment. Self-control means that we avoid getting involved in things that are immoral or unspiritual, but we also avoid things that are simply trivial and unproductive. There's a seriousness. I mean, we're, yes, we're fun. I'm never, I'm never going to not try 
I stopped trying to be fun. I, I love life. I, I love to enjoy life. I love to enjoy life with you. And it's not about becoming a stoic and just sitting and, and contemplating on why I need to stay angry all the time because the world is falling apart. But I need to not worry myself with so many trivial matters. So here's just a, a couple of questions about our sound minds. Do you believe everything you read or hear? When someone comes to you with their side of the story, do you automatically believe it? Are you instantly swept into emotion? A student learning self-control takes a deep breath and a step back. A student learning self-control takes a deep breath and a step back. When you hear something shocking, particularly about someone else, we're, we're quick to say, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she did that. That's so unfair to that person. A self-controlled Christian who gives grace simply says, hmm, I'm pretty sure there's more to this than that. That is our automatic assumption and response when we hear things about people, any person, not just people in the church, but any person. Let me take a step back and a deep breath because that is what Christ is calling me to do. Secondly, we know that students live upright lives. Living a, a self-controlled life could relate to continuing to change us within or continue to change within us personally while living upright lives connects with our changed relationship with other people. So the first one, the, the, um, the what was the, the first one? Uh, the self-controlled life is, is my relationship with me. An upright life is my, is my relationship with others. This is, this is incredibly important because this is where people begin to see the changes in our lives as we live and interact with the world around us. Living upright means that we affirm what God says. We don't contradict it. One of the best ways that we can grow in this area is to begin to, to, to faithfully obey the word of God. And to do that, we need to know the word of God. As a student, let me ask you, are you daily interacting with God's word at some level? I'm not telling you to read an hour a day. I'm not telling you to read 20 minutes a day. You can read a verse. You can, you can ask your phone to send you a verse of the day. You can interact with God's word at some level every day. You should then want more. You should ask God for, for hunger, to desire to want to read it and ingest his word into our soul more and more. So are you even doing that? Are you taking advantage of the countless ways that God's word is available to you every single moment? Are you a student of the Bible or are you just a casual observer? Thirdly, students live godly lives. Living a godly life refers to our changed relationship with God himself. So first, we have the relationship changed in us. Second, we have the, the relationship changed with the world around us. And now this is the relationship with God himself. Students grow by watching and mimicking their teacher. Do we see the world as God sees it? Do our hearts and our desires reflect God's hearts and desires? Does reaching people for Christ and sharing the gospel matter deeply to us? Because it matters to God. Does the lostness of our world move us to compassion or to apathy? Jesus told us why he came. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's pretty clear. God cares about lost things. That story right there comes after many examples of, of, of Jesus talking about how important it what is to find lost things. You lose a coin in your house. You tear it apart to find the coin. You, you find a, a lost pearl in a field. You dig everything. You, you sell everything to, to own that field. You do everything. You, the sheep goes away. You, you leave the 99 and you go find that thing. You find that sheep. The prodigal goes and you wait longingly for the lost thing. Jesus cares about lost things. Deeply about lost things. In fact, that's why he came to seek and to save the lost. Again, isn't that what we talked about earlier? He shows up and he gives. He comes and he saves. It's beautiful. So have we adopted that mission or are we just all about ourselves? If God cares so much for the lost that he sent his son, it's impossible to live a godly life that is absent of a deep concern for lost people. Our mission must always include seeing people come to repentance and follow Jesus as Lord. So lastly, 
each of those characteristics is part of the purification process. Jesus has redeemed us from wickedness and is purifying us through our relationship with him and his teaching of us through the Holy Spirit daily if we will listen. And through that process, something tangible should be the result. It should produce students who are eager for good works. Good works are the natural byproduct of a student of Jesus. Other Bible versions use the word zealous, and I love that word zealous. Simply put, we are to become good deed zealots with a burning passion to care for others. Paul, did, Paul doubles down on this concept one chapter after this in the book of Titus by summarizing all that we have just studied and saying this. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously, there's that concept, generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. We are to be excellent and profitable for everyone. God's people are careful to do good deeds. We go out of our way and we go to great lengths and take great pains to do good things. We are saved in order that God might demonstrate his glorious, extravagant grace through us. And I love this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We stand for him. We stand in place of him as though God were making his appeal through us. If God is making his appeal through you, what kind of appeal is he making? Is it a good one? Is it a convincing one? Good deeds are not to be a, a kind of add-on to our Christian lives, something that we do at our convenience, but they are to be a natural and integral part of our daily living. So do you actively look for ways to be a blessing to others? Imagine the impact on our little community if every single one of us was zealously committed to the good of others, regularly doing good deeds, like daily doing good deeds. I know what would happen. Jesus told us. He said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we do good deeds, we glorify our Father in heaven. That's the result of our goodness. If God shows up, we show up. If God gives, we give. We go. We look for the good we can do, and because we good, the good we can do, and we do it because God wants all people to come to a saving knowledge of God through repentance. The point of the passage today was, the, was this, that Jesus came to us, so we must go to others. And when we are careful to do these things, we will look different to the world. We will become, we will represent God's people. We will look like him. God will purify our hearts and our desires, and we will become distinctly different from the world around us in good ways. We will garner attention for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. By doing these things, we will become uniquely fitted and equipped for God's purposes. Simply put this way, God's spirit in us, making his appeal through us. Think about that. God's spirit in me, making his appeal through me. God is making his appeal through us. He's telling the, the world around us about himself through us. What is the message that the world is receiving? Let's pray. Father, thank you for co-opting us into your plan, into your eternal plan to save a lost and hurting and broken world. Lord, I confess too often when I see the brokenness and the, and the unbelief that I, I, I respond with animosity and frustration and anger and bitterness toward unbelievers, Lord, but that is not your heart. I was once that embittered and angry person, and I cursed you with my anger, and I cursed you with my rebellion, and I cursed you with my apathy. And Lord, you reached out to me, 
And you received me with your extravagant, good, and wonderful grace. And Lord, if I would dare receive that grace, I must then be a dispenser of that grace. Teach us, Lord, as a church, as students, to be the men and women that you have called us to be, your ambassadors, making your appeal to the world through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a transition here into a time of communion, we see another element of this passage that is communicated consistently throughout Scripture, and that is that Jesus is coming back. We do all these things, as the text told us, while we await, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed and, and would be sent to his death, he told us what his death would mean. But more than that, he gave us a sensory representation of what it means. Through communion, I love that we can taste and we can touch and we can smell the reality of his sacrifice for us. We read about the institution of the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, where it reads this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then Jesus makes this final statement, which kind of ties into what we're talking about today. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When I come back and we will do this again. Jesus say, is saying, I'm going away, but I'm coming again. And to those awaiting the, the blessed hope, it will be a glorious appearing. It will be a beautiful day. This is a great reminder that as much as communion is about self-reflection and reordering our relationships, it is about looking forward to Christ's return. Communion in the church is as much about the hope of Jesus' return as it is about his great sacrifice on our behalf. At the well, if you're visiting with us today, I want you to know that we, we practice what we call an open table. We believe that biblically communion should be open to all believers, not closed to a particular church or denomination. We believe that what, what's important is that the participants in communion have confessed and repented of their sin and are devoted followers of Jesus Christ, walking in unbroken fellowship with Jesus and with other believers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we simply ask that before receiving the bread and the cup, we each must personally examine our motives and understand that no matter what church we belong to, irreverence, prejudice, selfishness, anger, and pride have no place at the Lord's table. We rid ourselves of those through confession before we receive. And so, ideally, the church will become stronger every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper because we, are all, because we all genuinely and collectively consider everything that needs change in our life and character and consistently confess it and turn to God. Our gratitude opinion, and wonder of God should increase every time we receive the elements. For those of you who are visiting with us, I want to, you to know that as we receive, uh, we have our, our own special way here. Other churches have done it too, so I guess it's not that special for us. But you'll stand uh, where you're at, and you'll move to the right of your aisle. You'll come down. There's a station. There are four stations down here, and you will take the bread, and you'll take the cup, and there's a trash can for your cup. Uh, and then you'll return to the opposite side and just kind of slide where you're going. It's, it's very smooth, and it works out very, very well for us. And then we'll, we'll just go into that time in just a few moments here. And uh, just want to let you know that if you have children with you, um, because we do believe in, in a, a believer's communion receiving, um, that you as your parents, I call you your, your, your kid's first pastor, must be you. Uh, we, we want you to have made that determination whether it's appropriate for your child to receive communion, which means they have confessed their sin, they've repented, and they've turned to Jesus Christ for salvation. That's your call, not our call. We know that God works with our children in an amazing way. I came to, to faith the first time at a very young age, <laughs> went through some rebellion, came back again. But I know that God works in our lives at any age, 
And so if it's appropriate for your child to receive communion this morning, we'll let you make that determination. Let's pray prior to receiving this. Father, thank you for this bread, which represents your body, which we talked about earlier, Lord, which was given for us in horrific ways that we would truly understand as we touch it that this was a real thing that happened. This is not a spiritual concept that we thought about or we think about. This is a real thing, a real man, a real God man dying on a cross for our sins. And Lord, as we think about that, also we cannot help but think about the blood which flowed from your wounds, the wounds covering your body, covering your head, running down your face, running down your back, the wounds that, that scarred you even eternally, Lord. We know that when, when you came back from the grave, you showed your scars, Lord. You were still scarred as a reminder of our sin and our brokenness. So as we think about those scars, we think about the blood that was shed when they were created. And Lord, the, the word that we all have for this bread and this cup today is that we appreciate the cost. So as we receive this bread and this cup today, Lord, we do it with gratitude and full appreciation of the cost of securing our salvation. We pray this and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This bread has been taken, broken, blessed, and prepared for you. The cup, too, has been blessed and poured to be shared. The table of the Lord is now open for you to humbly and gratefully receive.
Would you please stand and sing this last song with us? sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life Redeemed on their beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to grass. When death was arrested, my life began. I'm a Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Sing it, church.
hope that over the next uh, weeks and months to come, if there's a shift you see in what we are and who we are and what we're doing, it's that we're renewing our commitment to reaching lost people for Jesus Christ. I don't want to say we've moved away from that or we ever moved away from that, but I don't know that it's been the focal point that it's been that it is necessary that it is. If Christ cared about lost people, we must care about lost people. If death was arrested and my life began and my salvation, then we should desire that for others. At Pentecost, they went out. On that day, 3,000 people were added to their number by the Holy Spirit. So we don't just sit in our room, our 120 people, and, and, and cower from the world. We embrace the brokenness and watch God do His work. If you brought an offering this morning, leave it on your way out in the offering bins. I wanted to remind you that the, the only way that, that at reaching the lost is going to be successful is if we pray about it. So if you want to be on that prayer warrior team, please remark that in your, in your bulletin and also leave that in the offering bins on your way out. We want to start connecting you with that prayer uh, exercise and with that prayer um, initiative that we're going to go under. So as we close, let me just ask God to bless us by simply saying, now may the grace and peace and presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you and abide with you both now and forevermore. God bless and amen.